All right. All right, so thank you all so much for joining us today. This is the very second session of what we have now called the Free Fuse Sessions. Wrong side, as you can see <laughs> over here. So um, pleasure to have you all join us today. We're really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I am here with Eric from Harmony Insights and also the creator and uh, founder of the, uh, uh, the HR Hot Seat. And so I'm just so excited to have Eric here. He has some really fantastic insights uh, re uh, regarding workplace communication and uh, helping with uh, introverts as well in terms of how they might be able to network with folks. Um, but I just can't really do it justice. So Eric, if you want to go ahead and uh, share a little bit more about yourself, what you do, and then we can kind of just kick off with this whole conversation. Of course, Mike, I'm glad to be here and honored to be your second session. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So as you mentioned, um, I'm Eric Kershaw. I founded HR Hot Seat, an inclusive mastermind community. We have thousands of, of members in 14 different licensed chapters, uh, licensed chapters around the country. And I know we'll get into more of that later, but you know, we're coming together to, to tackle common challenges in a mastermind style um, format. Um, I'm also the owner of uh, Harmony Insights LLC. I'm a big disc nerd. I love helping companies and consultants bring the disc personality to life for their, their teams and their clients. So we can get into that as well. Um, I have a corporate HR background. I spent 16 years in corporate HR, so that informs a lot of what I do. Um, I sing classically. I'm in a couple of classical choirs here in Chicago. Uh, I've run a couple marathons. I don't know what other random information you want about me, but it all informs how I approach the work that I do. I uh, gotta say, uh, did not see you in the classical choir uh, realm. <laughs> I uh, I gotta say, uh, you know, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it takes a certain level of obviously uh, some fantastic skill to be able to perform at that level. So you'll have to drop me a link to um, you know sharing one of the uh, performances that you've done. I uh, did classical music for such a long time myself, so oh, yeah. I have very much appreciation for that. You know, Chopin. You know, played a lot of Bach, Mozart all of that stuff. So, um, but I did want to actually ask you a little bit about HR hot seat, of course, you know, that being, you know, kind of, uh, one of the things that you've developed over the course of your career. So when you were developing HR hot seat, how did you get the idea? Was there something like out there that you were like, I need to create this mastermind for folks to really feel like there was a sense of community or was there something specific that you saw that you were like, this needs to be made and I will be the one to spearhead this? <laughs> well, it was a mix of a couple of different things. I had left corporate America and started my own business, Harmony Insights, around DISC. And, and part of me, just very selfishly, I didn't want to get too far from HR. It was my background. Um, I really like HR professionals and, and people. And so I thought, well, I don't want to get too far from the profession and, and HR professionals are often the ones that are bringing me in to, to do the disc work that I do. So I, I saw it sort of as a marketing effort. Um, more importantly, I would argue at the time I was doing a whole bunch of networking. You know, I, I had been happily employed and as an introvert myself had no interest in professional networking. And suddenly I needed to have a network in place and I didn't have one. I really wasn't active on LinkedIn. I wasn't doing doing anything um to build that network and i thought you know what i need to figure out what this is all about started bouncing around chicago and elsewhere um volunteering and attending various events and so much of it mike felt very transactional and superficial to me i thought you know what i i would come home with any number of business cards but i had not really gotten to know anybody and so i thought you know what i want to create the community that i would want to be a part of one where you are you're showing up but maybe still trading business cards but you're connecting meaningfully with your peers and and other professionals and that was sort of the beginning of um what has now become hr hot seat yeah and you know what's so interesting about you know the hr you know, the hr hot seat you know concept of course is like it's a it's really this community for hr professionals and you know, I will very much echo the sentiment of you go to these networking groups and you pass around business cards, you, you connect on LinkedIn, but there's not really like actionable steps sometimes <clears throat> to really, you know, connect in a meaningful way. 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I've noticed even utilizing like a networking platform like Lunch Club, for example. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, basically you can have like one-to-one -one conversations. And I make it a point actually to, after the conversation to try and meet some of these folks in person um, because I do like to sort of build out these relationships um, and find ways to just be helpful and just, you know, stay in touch. And, you know, like you mentioned, when you were starting out and trying to build that network, when you don't have it, um, you know, it is a challenge in the beginning. But uh, I've found that it's a real good intention, you know, sometimes to just try and do good for other folks, right? And to really try and provide, you know, sort of some value up front, because I really enjoy just trying to figure out ways or connecting dots to helping people. Um, so, you know, I'm uh, I'm sure you probably saw the same thing when you were building, um, you know, building what you were trying to do with Harmony Insights and HR Hot Seat, right? Well, that's, I mean, that's ultimately what it came down to. Although I'll tell you, Mike, I didn't go into it thinking about that necessarily in those terms. Mm. I had to learn the value of, of, <laughs> putting good into the world, you know, and I, I, maybe that sounds so dramatic, but, you know, I'm somebody who likes to quantify ROI and, and, and I'll say to myself, you know, if I'm going to spend $5 or five minutes on something, I, I want to have a sense of what the, that return is going to be, you know, because time is valuable. Money is valuable. Of course, I had to learn sort of the art of spending the money or spending the time on something where you don't necessarily know what the ROI is going to be, but you know, it's, it's doing good of one sort or another. And I think Zig Ziglar, among other people, have talked about the universal law of reciprocity that says if you help enough other people get what they want, you will get what you want. So with HR Hot Seat, you know, yes, a goal of it um, was very much building genuine rapport with HR professionals who might bring me in to do a disc workshop. But I thought if that doesn't happen, that's OK. I, I still have the opportunity to serve these folks in ways that they've shown up to be served, even and, and maybe especially if it never has anything to do with disk. Now, you know, six plus years later with, with thousands of members, you can imagine a fraction <laughs> of that audience, you know, is interested in a conversation about disk. The vast majority are looking for introductions, looking for connections, looking for work, looking for inspiration, you know, wanna be a part of a book club. The list goes on and on. If I can do those things for those people, you know, I'm, I'm building genuine rapport, building fruitful relationships that are going to pay off or not in ways that I couldn't possibly anticipate. That's a fantastic way to, you know, and I appreciate the progression of the story, right? Because I, I feel like, um, you know, when, when people talk about like giving value, it's almost like kind of like a token sort of thing. Like people, you know, you'll, you'll read a book or you'll read like a blog post about, hey, give your users value, give the people who, you know, are around you value. And I've always just felt like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, it's, people say it so much. It's almost like in a way, like not it, the, the actual meaning of it isn't as powerful as it could be anymore and people look at it as oh i gave value people let me check that checkbox off here <laughs> right well let me let me give you another example if you don't mind you know sure. in another networking situation you could come in you know you will likely be the service provider in the group i'm mike from free fuse and they're going to slap a particular color sticker on your chest and they're going to stick you in the corner behind the shrubbery <laughs> and so you're going to be sort of the outcast you know because i think traditionally networking you find that service providers are sort of preying on practitioners in some sense you know looking for business and i i understand how that's happening and, and sometimes it's more or less um explicit, I suppose, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, just obvious. But in HR Hot Seat, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, Mike is going to come in as representative of FreeFuse, and there's plenty that he can do for your organization with regard to indexing video and everything that we know about FreeFuse, which is valuable, but you're not leading with that. You're showing up mm -hmm. saying, I want to help you tackle whatever challenge you happen to be facing, even and especially if it is outside of my wheelhouse. So somebody needs an introduction, you know, maybe to someone who can facilitate diversity and inclusion conversations. Well, maybe that's not necessarily a service that you formally provide. Maybe it is. If it's not, and you bend over backwards to make that introduction to do some research, you are building genuine rapport with other members in a way that is so beneficial to you 
over the long term. Eventually, someone may need to engage free fuse. Maybe they don't. Either way, you're growing your network in a way that I would argue is so much more meaningful than, than takes place at your average professional networking event. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, <clears throat> it's it's funny because it's like networking, you know, uh, at a an, networking event is kind of like there's there's like different, you know, sort of sizes of, you know, things you can do. There's like the networking event, which might happen more regularly. There's the conference, which, which really is like, you know, kind of like an extension of that. Um, and you can, you know, make some cool relationships with folks at conferences. But at the end of the day, like there's a lot of people really there to just kind of extend business wise. And I, and I feel like a, a lot less of it is really kind of like this really nice constructive sort of way that we can build each other up. Like, um, you know, you, you're sharing with HR hot seat, um, you know, and, and kind of rewinding just really quickly. I was curious, actually, when you were first getting started, right, there's people who I feel like are probably trying to start their own communities, whether it is to, you know, uh, build up their you know, subject matter expertise with other folks who are subject matter experts, you know, or whether it's folks who are, you know, trying to build a community around their product, or some people use Discord to talk about NX NFTs and like, you know, crypto. Um, but that early kind of uh, community building and that early sort of network effect that you sort of have to create where everybody's interacting with each other and building that environment, when you were in your early days, just like, you know, just you idea, getting that initial thing started, um, what what were the challenges behind that to really build it to what it is today? Because you obviously, or maybe you did, but I imagine that you probably started with the flagship Chicago, you know, sort of HR hot seat, and then you grew from there. But what were the challenges trying to get people to buy into this concept of something new that they just weren't aware of? I love this. That's, a, that's such a great question. Off the top of my head, I think that there are a number of them. And honestly, I'm the sort of personality style that could be very um, demotivated when I stop to think too long about what those potential challenges could be. You know, I'm somewhat risk averse and I think, oh, if that's not gonna work, I may as well not try it. So I'm glad in the beginning, I wasn't aware of all of the risks that were actually in place <laughs> and the challenges in place. A couple of them that come to mind though, Number one is um, I was up against this this traditional concept of networking that we've already talked about, where people mm -hmm. think it's superficial and transactional. Why would I want to belong to yet another group? Um, I think that was a big piece of that uh, puzzle. Two, um, a challenge was getting out of my own way. You know, um, as somebody as I've mentioned who's showing up as an introvert, I'm thinking, wait a minute. I want to build a community of people that I don't know to network with. <laughs> like, that's the sort of thing that I've always avoided. So it's it's understanding my own challenges in terms of how I'm wired and, you know, embrace those, really sit with them and, and maybe dance with them a little bit and say, no, wait a minute, why, why am I pushing back? What is it about how I view and define networking? that's a challenge in this case, you know, in terms of, of growing this community. Um, I would argue another one may be sort of being myopic in this idea that I would be serving Chicago area HR professionals. You know, it hadn't crossed my mind that HR professionals, as it turns out, live and work well beyond Chicago. And it took somebody coming to me from Southville, Southville Greenville, South Carolina, to say, I've heard what you're doing in Chicago. I would like to do something similar here in Greenville. How can we make that happen? And, you know, licensing is how we made that happen. Um, I would say lastly, and again, that's such a good question. It's bringing so many things to mind. Lastly, I needed to understand what community was and how I was already building it. So if I thought of myself as going from zero to community, that was too big of a leap for me. I had to understand that in speaking, in making introductions, in bringing people together in the various ways that I was already doing, that I was already building community. So many people come to me and say, Eric, you know, I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn and I do all this speaking, but I, you know, I, I have yet to begin building community. How do I go about doing that? And I have to remind them, if you are encouraging two or more people to collaborate in any way, 
there is community built into that effort. So recognize what you are already doing as building community. Now you can put whatever label you want on that. You can grow it to whatever size you want. You can have it in whatever format you choose to have it take. But don't disregard the fact that you have already begun building community. Yeah, it, and you know, I think that a lot of people, <clears throat> a lot of people look at community as you know a large amount of people, right? Like they look at it like you need to have like a hundred people, and now you have a community. Like no, you have a community of like you know even the smallest <laughs> you know sort of atomic size of community, right? And I think that a lot of people take that for granted, right? And it's it's kind of like the interper the interpersonal communication aspect of being people. The you know sociability uh, is just kind of like ingrained in us to some level and some degree. Um, and when we kind of harness that and and really become aware of it and we, you know, try and facilitate these things in a very nice and healthy way, that's really uplifting, then it really does already become community, right? Like even so much as talking to, you know, the folks who you maybe see on your everyday commute, or if you go to like a gym and you just like, you know, talk to the folks who work at the front desk, that in and of itself is just like an aspect of community. Um, but so I, I bring it even sorry to interrupt, but even to bring it closer to home, we just got through the holidays. If anybody sat around a dinner table with family, maybe introducing new family members who have joined, you know, recently, you're building community. It's, it's just, um, I think it's one of those words that people see with a capital C, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in places and they think, well, I have to, you know, the community is something beyond me or something that I have to bend over backwards to to build and i just want to remind folks odds are you're already either building it or or involved in the building of it in some way that you haven't you know fully uh, appreciated yeah absolutely and uh you know kind of going to something interesting that you said right like when you were first kind of developing this whole thing if you if you knew actually what the challenges and the actual like involvement were was going to be you might have maybe taken a pause right and <laughs> I think that, you know, it, that's, uh, you know, introvert, extrovert, you know, what have you, maybe different disc profiles. I'm sure that there's certain disc profiles that, you know, uh, are leaning towards action. I can't remember all the ones off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. I find it such a fascinating concept to think about uh, anything that you do and then really thinking about the vastness of it, right? Like what the, you know, the vast opportunity of something could be. Um, let's say for something like HR Hot Seat, I mean, you know, there's obviously the, the the capability of it to exist in all the major cities in the United States. You know, you probably even have chapters. I, I don't know if you have chapters already internationally, but the. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, I'll wish for it, too. We can, uh, we can wish on it together. But, um, you know, just the aspect of that and, and thinking about kind of the vastness of it, I find it such a fascinating thing to almost look at something and say, well, wow, there's just so much that that I have to do. And then getting that sort of analysis paralysis that, you know, can sometimes keep us from, you know, positive outcomes. Um, and I think that regardless of whether somebody is, you know, uh, a certain personality type, I, I've always felt like breaking something down into its smaller, more easily digestible kind of pieces has always just been the way to accomplish something much more, you know, with a higher probability of success, right? Whether it's, you know, you talked about running, uh, I think you mentioned running a marathon at the beginning of this, right? So mm -hmm. thinking about how you can actually break that up into the right. individual miles, right? So you don't go from sitting on your couch to running a marathon the next day, you know, there, are, <laughs> you build up to it. And if going into it to your point if you were aware of everything that you would need to do to get from point a to point b it, it could be it could be overwhelming and so focusing on okay what is the next step what is the one thing that i can do today that will move me in the direction that i want to head um you're exactly right I, I think it helps you make that progress if you're somebody like me who can um, become paralyzed by those details <laughs> absolutely um and you know i guess for you know folks who are really trying to develop something that they feel like they have a good idea towards like whether it's a product idea whether it's actually a community that they're building or whether it's maybe just like a new type of strategy of how they want to approach something even internally in their company maybe they are an hr person who's trying to institute <clears throat> the disc assessments or a new system of how they want to approach things 
How do you recommend maybe perhaps taking those initial ramp up steps to get them to a place where they can feel like, you know what, I am making some fantastic progress here. It is a large goal, but I can somehow see where we can fit this in piece by piece and I can actually make inroads towards being successful with this. That's a great question because it's it's something that you could say, well, it's um there's so many different audiences for that sort of question. I'm thinking immediately of the speaking I've done at different incubators and startups around Chicago with founders or founders plus one or two people who are trying to get um, an idea off the ground, you know, so that's one version of this. Another is the internal HR practitioner who says, you know, I've never had to launch an onboarding program before. I don't even know where to begin, you know, um, how can I make incremental steps in the right direction without becoming overwhelmed by, you know, what what may be involved in a project like that. A couple of things that I think of number one is to recognize I'm all about self awareness. <laughs> so, you know, as somebody who's sort of naturally introspective, I show up and say, I don't know, there's much you can do in confidence or with confidence in life without spending some time looking within know thyself, right. And, um, when I think about the work that I've done with HR Hot Seat, it would be easy for me to think, well, it just sort of came out of the blue and I turned it into something. And yes, it took time, but I had never done anything similar to it before. But when I really stopped to consider, you know, this, this grand project that I've undertaken, I think, well, I've actually done this in various ways previously. In college, I started a fan club for my roommate um because he was kind of a, a quirky fun guy and i just wanted to see if i could build up an audience around him you know and so that involved um, bringing people together and it involved sending out newsletters and a lot of the stuff that i do now with hr hot seat if i think about some of the work that i had done in my corporate hr role it was bringing folks together around the office to improve morale and sort of organize volunteers and some of the stuff that i'm doing now with HR hot seat. So I think step one is recognizing, um, and I have this conversation around meaningful work left and right, but you know, what is it that I want to do? What would I find a lot of meaning in? And what am I bringing to this project that already puts me ahead? I, I may not be starting as a blank s slate or from scratch. I may be starting with more of a, a ramp um, and a springboard than that I'm than I'm aware of. So I think that that is one thing is just bringing it, looking within and bringing that that self awareness. And I think uh, number two is being reasonable about how you define success and progress. You know, so if we can go back to our networking example, say that our challenge is, you know, I need to I need to get a job or I need to get uh, funders or I need, you know, whatever it happens to be, if that is your goal in networking it is potentially such a, a grand a grand goal in a um, uh, a challenging uh, outcome or objective that it's going to be difficult to take steps in that direction so instead i would think okay what is um you know i need to get a job well what if i just met one person at this event what if i came home with maybe a maximum of five business cards, meaning I had five really good, in depth, meaningful conversations, maybe I don't get a job offer out of it, maybe I'm not, uh, I don't even have that opportunity to mention that I'm looking for work. Um, but I have five really good conversations that could be very positive for me or at work, I have to launch this new, this new program. Well, I don't have to get it launched tomorrow. So what can I do in the meantime, maybe I can have an in informational conversation with one peer in my LinkedIn network who works for another organization that has done similar work just to get some best practices. You know, that's that's doable. That's something that I can do tomorrow. If you tell me that I'm ultimately responsible for launching my company's new onboarding program, you know, I may tender my resignation and <laughs> find something else to do unless, of course, that's that's uh, a rewarding challenge for me. You know, you know, it's fun. Well, first of all, hilarious that you started a, a fan club for just a person because <laughs> he was a quirky person. Why not? That's, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I remember, uh, when I was, I, when I was in college, actually, uh, a friend of mine did kind of like a similar thing where like they started a fan club of like somebody else we knew and they had just like pictures that they took of them like across <laughs> campus. And I was like, this is, this, this is such a silly concept, but they got like, I think like, 
four thousand people to like join this group and so, there are pp people like commenting like hey uh look this is i saw that guy on campus this is this is really cool like i'll, I'll you know when i like see him next and and put that up and so uh that's uh people people can find the the, the most interesting things and you know can find the most uh you know quirky things actually to be something that they can have a, a community around so that that brings a lot of joy to my heart there <laughs> um, you know, uh, and uh, I'd like to say, you know, even just in, in terms of this step-by-step -step process, right? Like, I think that what's interesting and, you know, something that I've kind of seen uh, for folks that I've like advised, right? And like folks that I've said, hey, you know, a lot of people ask me like, hey, what is my first step? What is it that, that I feel like that I, sh you know, I should be doing? And I never like to tell them what to do, right? I feel like, you know, you kind of want to take the approach of, you should be able to, you know, kind of take that step on your own, iterate when you don't find, you know, when you feel like you haven't found that, you know, sort of step that you think makes sense and then, you know, continue going. But um, I feel like sometimes uh, it can just be so hard for people to just get started, right? Like just feel like they've gone to a place where, uh, you know, they, they can actually take that step because it's almost like a level of accountability, right? Like once you, once you kind of get that initial step going, you've now put the wheels in motion and, uh, you know, it's almost sometimes easier to, to almost feel like you put things off uh, or put something off because then you, you, you know, you don't have to feel like, well, I, I did one step, I took a break and then like, I do another step that the momentum's not there anymore. Right. Um, and it's kind of something that I've seen uh, even for folks who like use our platform, right? Like they've, a lot of people have found like the ability to break up their videos as like an initial point and then building around it as a good way to almost say, I already have like a giant step out of the way, right? It's, it's something that I can build around. And so, um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on people who kind of like have a challenge, I, I would say with getting started, right? Like what it, you know, you've, you've provided some really cool actionable steps, but, you know, even sometimes when it seems so small and something that they can do, I've, I've found that people really still struggle with it, right? So what is your, um, what is your maybe advice on what I like to call ignition, getting yourself yeah. like to actually start the car and getting, you know, getting going? Um, I'm immediately thinking of, you know, I've, I've, done some research around personal finance over time just to you know for, for various um various reasons and so when it comes to getting out of debt i learned that a lot of people focus on the number side of it uh, especially mm -hmm. for those of us who think a little bit more logically and black and white and, and quantifying things you know and so if i if i'm in debt and i need to get out of debt i may look at uh, my highest interest credit cards for example and think well you know those are costing me the most and so um, I'm gonna knock out the, the highest, the largest amount on my highest interest credit card because financially that's gonna make a lot of sense, you know, get that one out of the way so I don't have to deal with that high interest credit card. Then there's another approach, which is, well, yes, you know, financially that may make a lot of sense, but um, behaviorally <laughs> the quick win of paying off your smallest debt, regardless of the interest rate, um, allows you to experience some amount of confidence. You know, say, okay, I, I was able to do this. I'm able to make headway. Um, it's a quick win. It's a, it's an easy success. Now move on to the next larger um, debt that you have in place, regardless of what it's costing you. At first, I wanted to push back against that because I'm like, well, that makes no sense. You know, if I'm if I'm losing all the money on this credit card over here, that's the one that I should be going after. But behaviorally, it really does make sense um, to go after that quick win. So maybe the advice there is is to take a step back from a lot of the traditional advice that you might be getting <laughs> from other folks. You know, maybe it's counterintuitive to say that because um, if you ask enough people, there will be. Um, some common advice that you end up receiving time and again, more than likely, and at least question it and say, is this going to be right for me? You know, is this this advice that I'm getting in terms of next steps? Is it the best route for me to take? Or is there something more bite sized that will allow me to get a quicker win and prove to myself that this is something that I can do and build up that confidence of forward momentum 
that just becomes a habit. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'd like to, you know, kind of touch on that whole, you know, bite size idea, of course, as well, because, you know, the, the funny, the funny thing I feel like uh, sometimes is um, you'll, you'll see kind of like this bite size sort of, um, you know, this sort of bite size objective that you can do. And I feel like it's kind of that adage of it's easy to do, but it's easy to not do. Right. <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, sometimes that kind of adds into the whole analysis paralysis, like, oh, I'll just do it later. It's fine. And then later happens like 10 years past and you're like, oh, OK, like, whoops, I didn't do that in the time that, you know, I was supposed to. But um, I found that even for myself, like making things bite size and giving these actionable steps um, are just such a valuable thing because, Number one, you've given yourself almost like a runway of guidance, right? Like kind of like the, if you think about it, they're kind of like the bumpers at a bowling alley. I need to go and knock over these pins and I need to, need to stop rolling them into the gutters. I'm terrible <laughs> at bowling myself, so I, I don't want them to put the gutters up, but I would appreciate if they did more often. Right? <laughs> right. Um, but uh, it, it's something that I've seen also uh, product designers do. <clears throat> Um, where they'll they'll give you kind of like an idea of here are all the onboarding steps that you need to do to like actually build or actually get you stuff out of our product, right? And they make them bite-sized. Um, and I found that, you know, wh whether you're communicating product information, whether you're communicating, uh, you know, internal like meetings that are, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, some kind of uh, you know, like a learning seminar or something of the sort, um, when you share them at the largest amount of, you know, sort of what they can be perceived as, like if you send somebody an hour long video, chances are you're probably not going to have them look at the meeting that you've all had. Um, but it, it, they'll probably look at it if you send them like, you know, a smaller scale version, like a really quick, like, you know, 30, 30 seconds to one minute, because it's just the, the ignition for that is a lot smaller, you know. And I've found that even for us, right? Like we initially got like our start, um, you know, testing out free fuse with a bunch of uh, students from Gen Z. Um, and we saw a similar kind of behavior, right? They wouldn't watch stuff that was like an hour long. They would go and, but they would do it and use, you know, our, uh, you know, use our tools because when we actually ran those videos through the auto editor, you they would actually actionably know that there was steps and kind of a pathway for them to explore. And they found that the videos were like a minute long. And I've, I've kind of found this phenomenon, which is really interesting, which is, you know, a lot of them said they retained the information in a way that was constructive, but they also didn't feel like they went through an hour long of video, even when they kind of explored the bite sized bits. And I kind of liken that to an overall journey that we might have about building anything, whether it's the community aspect, a new initiative at a company or, you know, reducing the credit card debt on all of my statements, right? It is in and of itself, uh, we know an endpoint, right? But we don't really know what I need to do sometimes to get there. And while it is good to kind of have these sort of bumper lanes of here are all the seven things that you need to do. Sometimes it's really kind of more of like a, a zigzag flow of experience and you kind of need to sort of figure out what to do next. But um, it's really important, I feel like, to have it broken out into much more actionable, smaller things that you feel like you can do. And uh, I, I just have always, you know, kind of seen that when you do communicate in that way or when you do experience things in that way, it's just like a lot better for someone to wrap their head around where you're trying to take them. Um, and I feel like that's kind of how some of the best product designers in, in the world or, you know, some of the best experienced designers in the world, you know, whether it's like, if you think about it, um, uh, there's, there's processes, right? Like 12 steps to doing this. There's the eight minute apps. There's all of these, you know, things that can kind of, you know, ladder you up into getting what it is that you want. But there really is this kind of concept of how do we make it actionable to where your confidence grows with each moment that you have as you continue moving forward. Um, so uh, I guess in, in, in terms of that, um, you know, I did want to ask you uh, a little bit about uh, how you are currently working through what you consider to be meaningful, fulfilling work, right? Because I feel like in regards to 
you know, sort of setting these particular objectives um, and what you've been able to accomplish everything through Harmony Insights and HR Hot Seat. I'm curious where you see, you know, kind of your, you know, definition of um, meaningful, fulfilling work and, you know, how others can actually go out and find their own meaningful and fulfilling work that they feel like they can build this concept of bite-sized ways to reaching their objectives. Well, as you can imagine, it's a very subjective concept. Sure. <laughs> My idea of meaningful, fulfilling work may be, you know, hellish for you, <laughs> you know, um, and and vice versa. Um, or we could see eye to eye on it. I think it um, it uh, for me it it begins with, as I mentioned before, being very introspective and understanding myself. You know, I I want to say even before that, I, I would argue that meaningful, fulfilling work can be somewhat of a luxury. I've done some career coaching and, and when people show up and I ask what their objectives are, I say, you know, do you have the luxury of time and resources to do work that is especially meaningful and fulfilling, or do you need a paycheck? There is no judgment either way. <laughs> if you need a paycheck and you're willing to take on work that you don't necessarily define as meaningful and fulfilling, that's perfectly fine, you know? Um, but if you have the luxury of time and resources to to define and pursue meaningful fulfilling work i think there's some things you can consider how are you wired how are you uniquely wired what strengths do you bring to your work and to your relationships you know if i'm if i know i'm somebody who's fairly detail oriented which i am how is that something that plays out in the work that i do um how can you step away from the titles that you've had in the companies that you've worked for to consider that you have strengths and experiences that are transferable. I think a lot of us, you know, I spent 16 years in HR. If I wanted a, a different job and maybe in a different industry, it would be easy for me to say, well, I've only spent 16, I've spent 16 years doing only HR work. I couldn't possibly go into marketing or sales or, you know, um, something in tech because that's not how I'm built. That's not the experience that I have. As a career coach, I used to have people write down the building blocks of meaningful work that they've had. So no titles, no companies, but the things that they did that um, they found to be rewarding on different slips of paper, throw them up into the air, have them drop on the ground and pick up a few of those slips. And suddenly it paints a picture that is maybe different than the work that they did. It's, it's these little building blocks that you can reassemble over here in a way that no longer looks like HR. You know, it might look like something very different, but it still incorporates um, the strengths that you know that you bring, um, the personal values, the alignment of values. So many people now are saying, I want, I want work that aligns with my values. I don't care about your ping pong table. I don't care about your free lunch. I don't care that you take us to bowling alleys and put out bumpers so that I get a strike every time. <laughs> what I want, you know, is to work for a company whose values align with my own, but that means you have to know your values. You have to understand what it is um, that you value in life in order to be able to align those with a, a potential employer. So, you know, meaningful, fulfilling work could look like any number of things to any number of people, but I think it begins with the introspection of understanding what you value, um, what strengths you bring to work and relationships and looking for those things, not settling, but looking for those things in either a traditional W-2 um, job or work that you create for yourself. I, you know, and I got to say, I find that to be a fantastic way to look at it. Cause you know, I think that a lot of folks, um, sometimes will settle for things cause you know, the security is nice, right? That you get a nice job and then there's certain aspects in, you know, some cultures, um, you know, where, um, you know, getting a certain job is like, you know, seen as a wild success, but you're also wildly unhappy. Yeah, and you're empty inside you go home and you i don't know hang your head at the very least and maybe adopt some unhealthy habits <laughs> at the worst you know? yeah adopting unhealthy habits i think is, <laughs> is is a very very common one you know and i think that i think that if there was a, you know like you said if there was a way to do that introspection and really align ourselves with something that we feel like is actually you know and and some people call it like bringing you joy, I guess, like, even if you do perhaps work at a place where, you know, you're, you're, you're not feeling, 
you know, the, the best in terms of being there, there is a way to almost, you know, sort of think about what your next move can be. You're not trapped there. And then you can now actually look um, for ways to actually have fulfilling, meaningful work that is going to whether contribute to your own happiness, that perhaps the happiness of others, if that, you know, brings, you know, life and joy to yourself or, you know, anything of the sort that you feel like is under the criteria of what you think is going to be meaningful for others. And I think that if we come from a place where we feel like we're doing meaningful things and, you know, there are ways to almost cross-link that with service to others, kind of going from the thematic of how we started this, I think when you can kind of mold all of those things together, I think we'll actually have uh, you know, a, a place where, you know, every one of us could really enjoy what we do and really build something special for others and together. And I think that that's, you know, kind of why I've always appreciated the collaborative elements and why, you know, I believe that, you know, building things together, building meaningful things, it's kind of what really gets me going in terms of, you know, building out our own, you know, product and company or, you know, building out, you know, my own network and helping others and really looking at that as a, you know, part of what I am, what I do and how I can contribute to the greater world around me. Um, I'll tell so, you, Mike, I had an aha moment along the way that I wanted to share because I think it's appropriate. Absolutely. I confused what I was good at with what I was passionate about mm. or vice versa. I thought I'm good at this thing so I must be passionate about it, but I wasn't, I was just simply good at it. You know, when I started in my HR career as an HR assistant, I found out very quickly that I was very good at alphabetizing um, paperwork. <laughs> Personnel files didn't matter. Hand me a stack of stuff. I, I was very good at alphabetizing paperwork. Mm. That didn't mean that I loved it. It didn't mean that I enjoyed it, you know? And it's, I think it's easy for us to build up an entire position and role around us that we happen to excel at, but don't necessarily find reward and fulfillment in. The moment you can distinguish between those two, and it doesn't mean you leave behind the stuff that you're good at, of course, you bring that with you. Um, but now you shift your focus somewhat to recognize that if it is possible to do work that is rewarding and fulfilling on a much deeper level, and not just work that I happen to be good at, what a fantastic combination you know that is there's a venn diagram and i don't have it in front of me i think there's a japanese term called ikigai i-k-i-g-a-i mm -hmm. i don't know if i'm saying that correctly but it's this fantastic venn diagram i've seen it with three or four interconnecting circles but talks about you know meaningful work or what you're meant to do or however you want to put it is the intersection of a number of different things what the world needs what you're good at, what you can be paid for, you know, there, there are different versions of this, where they all intersect is how you might define meaningful work. So I would recommend that your listeners look up this um, ikigai um, term. Yeah, I know. I'll be sure to uh, share the ikigai term, uh, or excuse me, the diagram, uh, perhaps yeah. in, you know, one of these sound bites that we want to go ahead and craft. Um, in the startup world, we do have our own similar one, which is like, what are you good at? What can you feasibly be paid for? And then yep. I, I forget the third one. I think it's like, what can you actually build? Right. And like, that's yeah. like the Venn diagram of like, and that little. Well, maybe what the world needs. Like, what does your audience need? You know, because without, without any one of those circles, you don't have, you may have an idea, but who knows how far it's going to go. You have to have every circle. And I, I, it sounds very similar to, to what I'm talking about. And there's something magical about the intersection of all of those circles. You know, if I'm doing um, something that I'm good at, and I can be paid for technically, but the world doesn't need it. I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, and, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with like also just enjoying things you don't get paid for too. Right. Like, but you know, there's, there's things that you need to kind of build a career and like a living on. So maybe finding that middle icky guy, I'm just going to call it that. <laughs> can be a, a truly, you know, a truly transformative experience. I've said to my wife that if I ever, you know, walked away from the work that I do now and I just need an hourly job, I don't know how meaningful this would be, but I, I could easily, and this gives you some insight into my own personality style. Are you ready for this? Yeah. I could easily work at Costco and be the guy that walks around and takes the empty boxes off of the shelves and then reorganizes, rearranges the remaining product. 
like I could spend all day do I could do that in my sleep I have music on I, you know I don't necessarily have to interact with folks just take out the empty boxes and reorganize the shelves how, I don't know how meaningful that is that would still be rewarding to me though you know given my personality style and the strengths that I bring to the work that I do that is just one version of any number of things that I could do to pass time to make money and to really enjoy um how I'm devoting myself to my output. <laughs> well, uh, at first I thought you were going to say, I could, I could see myself being the person who was going to try all the free samples. And I was like, Hey, if I can get paid to do that, <laughs> that's cool too. I'm with you. You and I can make a team of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I know that we uh, are running on time here, so I would love to, you know, kind of allow you the floor for one final uh, item. If you would like to share a little bit more about, you know, HR Hot Seat or, you know, the work that you're doing with Harmony Insights or, you know, share how people can get connected with you. We'd love to give you the floor so that, um, you know, you can share all the, the great ways that people can get a, be a part of your community. Well, I really appreciate that. I think I'm I'm connected with people who come to me needing one or another thing. Um, one is community. You know, typically HR professionals or folks who serve HR professionals that say, you know what, I want to connect meaningfully with my peers, with the people that I'm serving. Um, HR Hot Seat is an entirely free, inclusive mastermind community, and it all starts with creating a, a profile at hrhotseat.com. We have sponsors, we have licensing opportunities. I just really want people to experience what we do and how we do it, including uh, those of, uh, of your listening audience who may be on the introverted side of things. Um, it could be more fulfilling professional networking than they've ever done. Um, I help companies and, and consultants bring the DISC personality assessment to life. I love having conversations like the one that we've had that involves discussing cognitive diversity and bringing together um, differing personality styles and communication styles and making that work especially in the workplace, in a leadership capacity or a sales capacity or just general workplace communication. So HarmonyInsights.com is where people can go for anything related to Harmony Insights. And I spend far too much time on LinkedIn. The best way to get a hold of me is probably finding me Eric Kershot, Eric with a CH at the end, on LinkedIn. And uh, odds are, if you're finding me there, I'm active there and probably um, sitting in front of my messages, waiting for something to come in from you. So let's have a conversation on LinkedIn. Lovely. Well, that's how we met, right? So <laughs> <laughs> how fitting. <laughs> well, um, you know, Eric, thank you so much. This has been a phenomenal conversation. And for those of you out there, please go ahead and reach out to Eric. If, uh, you know, you want to get, uh, you know, be a part of that community. I'm sure that you will really enjoy it. I had an opportunity to sit in an HR hot seat and, I will, you know, will love an opportunity to go back there and, and check it out again as well. And, uh, you know, for this uh, second free few session, we really appreciate you all for taking the time out to take a look at uh, what we uh, had a conversation here about. We look forward to having you at our next free few session. Hope you all have a great rest of your day and we will talk to you again soon. Thanks.